الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So brothers and sisters uh, once again السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, so we are uh, starting our third uh, session of this uh, Madani uh, Sira period. Um, and um, uh, if uh, I'm not sure again, if uh, if there were any questions uh, from the previous two sessions, uh, we could pro probably start uh, by looking at uh, that and then going into our session today. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, then we go straight uh, into the session. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, go back over what we had covered in the pre previous uh, times, uh, previous two occasions. Uh, but th there will be a link, you know, I, uh, so what I'll be talking about today, there is a link between this and what we have talked about uh, previously. Uh, so let me see. Um, I'm uh, not sure again how to access the notes. If there are any, uh, if there are any notes or any questions, uh, someone can. In the chat, there's no question. Okay, okay. So we go ahead. Uh, so today, what I want to talk about are the uh, the what are known in uh, the Sarah as the Saraya, uh, and this is the plural of the word Sariya, uh, and then there are the Ghazawat, the plural of the word Ghazwa. So Sariya and Ghazwa are the plural forms of Saraya and Ghazawat. Uh, these are the military expeditions, uh, to use a broad term that covers both of them. Uh, uh, and uh, so we're going to discuss that. But before we do that, uh, uh, you know, that will be our main topic uh, today. And that will take us, you know, into the later, you know, the major battles and so on. Uh, of course, uh, not today, but just uh, today we're doing the groundwork uh, for all of that, uh, looking at you know, what the Prophet did in the, in the beginning in relation to this matter. Uh, so before we go into that, uh, just the last few words uh, on what we were discussing previously. Uh, and what was that? Uh, the, the Prophet said, um, uh, after migrating to Medina, he found uh, that there are different groups of people that he have to, has to deal with, right? Uh, there were different groups of Muslims, uh, uh, and the main uh, groups, uh, the Aus and the Khazraj in Medina itself, uh, the Prophet وسلم, brought them together under one term, and that is the Ansar. Uh, and the uh, immigrants, uh, uh, they came from all over, but the main place that they came from uh, was Mecca. So the majority were Meccans, but uh, there were people, uh, if not immediately, at least uh, later on, perhaps in a steady stream uh, of those who, are, who were accepting Islam in the Madani period. They were coming into Medina. Uh, and they are known as the Muhajirin, but especially the people from Mecca, so the Ansar and the Muhajirin. Uh, and the, then there were other groups, there were Mushrikeen, uh, both uh, inside of, uh, of Medina, the belonging uh, to the Aus and Khazraj, but they were now a minority, a very, very small minority. And there were the Mushrikeen uh, outside of Medina. Uh, the Arab tribes, the Bedouin tribes, and of course the main, uh, you know, antagonist uh, that is uh, the people of Mecca, uh, and then uh, there were the Jews in Medina, Ahlul Kitab, but specifically Jews, the Jewish tribes in Medina. Uh, there were hardly any Christians around. Uh, Christians came to visit later on, and maybe we'll get into that later. So we talked about uh, all of that. Uh, I want to just uh, add a few. There are many, many things that we can say, actually. Uh, you know, when we are finished uh, this series, um, we cannot say that we have accomplished everything. We have covered the entire Madani uh, period. There's so many things, so many details. Uh, 
and each one of them has lessons and insights uh, uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, to uh, think uh, deeply about them uh, and to discuss them deeply and so on. It takes up a, a, a quite a lot of time. We can't go into all of them. So uh, last few words, you know, concerning uh, the Jews. Uh, when the Muslims were in Mecca and the uh, Makki revelations were coming, uh, basically the Muslims had a good sort of impression of, uh, of uh, Bani Israel. Several terms are used uh, for them, but in the Makki period, the term Bani Israel was the term that was used. The term Ahlul Kitab was not used for them. Uh, perhaps uh, with the exception of one place, only one place uh, where uh, it is used in the Makki verses. So they were always referred to as the Bani Israel. Uh, even the term Yahud and Yahudi uh, was not used in the Makki verses of the Quran, just uh, Bani Israel. And Israel uh, was, of course, we know a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yaqub alayhi salam was called Israel. Uh, and so uh, th th that attaches them to a very noble prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so the impression that the Muslims were having of uh, Bani Israel was sort of favorable. They are the descendants uh, of prophets. Uh, they were followers of prophets. They might have disobeyed them here and there and so on, but generally they were believers. Uh, and uh, you, you uh, could have seen that also when uh, there was fighting between the Persians and the Romans. Uh, the Romans represented mainly Christians, uh, and the Muslims uh, sided with them because they were considered to be sort of believers as such. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we, you can see if you analyze the Makki verses you can see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying some negative things about them uh, which was more or less largely overlooked uh, when the Muslims migrated to Medina and they met the Jews uh, they perhaps uh, thought uh, that the Jews will be sympathetic uh, to them the Jews are believers, they believe in revelation, they believe in prophets and so on. Uh, and so you will have a lot of cooperation between the two groups and maybe many of them will come over into Islam and so on. But that did not happen. Uh, we said that uh, from the very beginning, the vast majority of them, including especially their rabbis, uh, the learned ones from among them decided to uh, be hostile and enemies uh, to the Prophet wasallam, although they recognized him as the Prophet uh, who uh, was uh, prophesied to come. Uh, you know, they refused to accept him. So that was the reality that uh, were, uh, the, uh, very few Jews accepted Islam uh, throughout the Madani period and pro perhaps also throughout the long history of Islam up to this time, very, very few Jews uh, compared to Christians have accepted Islam. Over the years, many, many Christians have uh, come into Islam. Uh, that is not so with Jews, but Alhamdulillah, I mean, there are those who, uh, those who have come into Islam. Uh, so this is a reality. And the Muslims were not, uh, not aware that this is what is going to happen. You know, they were expecting a lot of cooperation from the from the Jews. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning, uh, the Prophet Salam, as well as the revelation came to change their, their concept about this matter. This is something that needed changing and the reality of the Jews uh, needed to be exposed to them. Uh, and because of what the Jews started to do from the very beginning, uh, that reality became clearer and clearer to Muslims over time. Uh, I, I had mentioned uh, last week that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he told Zayd ibn Thabit uh, to learn the language of the Jews, uh, he said, you know, I don't trust them. And this is a, a situation that remained, you know, throughout uh, the rest, the remainder of his life. He did not trust them. But he was trying to make friends with them. Uh, he included them in the uh, Treaty of Medina, or the Pact of Medina, the, the Constitution, uh, 
uh, give them favorable mention, recognize them as a set of people by, uh, you know, by themselves as well as the people who belong to Medina and so on and so forth. Uh, but now the situation, uh, you know, as it started to develop uh, with them and their, their immediate show of hostility, uh, things had to be changed and the, the concept of Muslims or the perception of Muslims had to be changed uh, concerning them. And this is something that Professor Saddam set about doing uh, in various ways. We won't go into, into details, but uh, whenever the opportunity arose, he uh, tried to show that we are distinct uh, from them. Like uh, when uh, he discussed uh, the matter of uh, the fasting of Ashura, the fast of Ashura, which they said uh, that they were doing uh, because Musa alayhi salam did it. And the reason why he fasted on that day was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him and Bani Israel from Fir'aun and drowned in Fir'aun. Uh, so uh, the Prophet Sallam said that we are closer to uh, Musa alayhi salam than they are, so we have to fast. But as time went on in the Madani period, the last year of his life, he said, uh, if I live for the next year, we will fast uh, the day before and the day after, the day before and the day of Ashura itself. Uh, and uh, Or maybe the day uh, of Ashura and the day after it. Two days instead of one, because we want to be different uh, from the Jews. And there are many other occasions where the Prophet ﷺ said that we do not want to be like them. Uh, we will do things, things differently, even though it is uh, basically the same act. Uh, we will do it in a different way. Uh, also, I mentioned in the building of the masjid, after the masjid was built and they were discussing how their call to prayer should be, how can, uh, in what way can they announce that the prayer time has started. And the suggestion came up that they should follow the Jews or follow the Christians you know, using the bugle or using uh, um, the uh, the 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 bells uh, of the Christian using a horn uh, that the, the Jews use or using the bell that the Christians use. And he's, uh, the, uh, well, clearly he dismissed that idea. We don't want to follow them. We don't want to be like them. We're not going to imitate them. Uh, so that matter of not imitating the Jews, uh, it became stronger and stronger as time went along. So even the Qibla was changed uh, from what they were doing. Uh, even though it was the Qibla of prophets before Muhammad والسلام, the Prophet wanted that change and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually facilitated that change uh, for him, the change of the Qibla. Uh, so these are just a few examples, but many, many other things happened uh, where, which indicated that the Prophet did not want uh, to follow them in anything whatsoever. And uh, there is a statement that comes from him uh, where he says, uh, Man fahuwa minhum. Whoever imitates a people is one of them. Uh, uh, and so this applies uh, to imitating the Jews and Christians, and, and it applies to uh, imitating the Mushrikeen and any other group of people. So as time went along, this matter became uh, more and more clear that not only should we not be imitating them, but really they are not believers. Uh, uh, and we have no hopes in them, actually. As long as they remain on the path that they are on, we have no hopes in them. They are going to be our enemies. Uh, so that uh, continued to be established until they themselves, in fact, very early, uh, started to show open hostilities. And although the, the, the Pact of Medina said that nobody, nobody from Medina uh, should make allegiances, alliances, and so on with Quraysh. Yet they began to do that from a very early age, and they began to instigate Quraysh uh, to attack uh, the Muslims. Uh, they began to, began to side with Quraysh on various issues and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, this is one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, make sure that uh, you're clear about that from the very beginning, uh, uh, you know, as we go along in this discussion. And the second thing, there's another important thing con con concerning them also. 
and concerning uh, the Prophet's uh, efforts, alayhi salatu wasalam, to uh, establish a pure Islamic society in Medina. Uh, and we use the term Islamic State, but we should not understand uh, the term state you know, in a way that people use the term uh, state uh, to refer to different countries uh, today. There's a lot of corruption in, uh, in those concepts now, right? Uh, so we're talking about a pure Islamic state uh, that is built on Islamic principles, the pure Islamic principles built uh, cl clearly upon the Sharia. Uh, and because we, 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 are, you know, we are saying that because there are Muslims who do not understand the Sharia, uh, either they oppose the establishment of an Islamic state, right, uh, or uh, the, um, uh, if they uh, call for an Islamic state, uh, they, um, they see that Islamic State uh, as uh, following certain rules and regulations and so on that might be actually against the Sharia, not in keeping with this uh, with the text and the spirit of the uh, Sharia. So we have all that kind of complications uh, today. So the Islamic State in the early days uh, was uh, that uh, pure concept that we have uh, to go back to, or we are trying to go back to whenever we you know, delve deeply into the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're trying to understand that situation, you know, in its uh, purity uh, once again. So the thing that I want uh, to mention is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted to, uh, wanted to make sure uh, that the society was established in all aspects uh, on pure, you know, Islamic teachings, pure Islamic principles, uh, on the guidelines that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself on the revelation that is, of course, the Qur'an. Uh, he wanted everything to be pure. Uh, and there was uh, one thing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, among all of the things that he looked at, uh, he looked at uh, the economic situation in Medina. And who's in control of uh, the economy in Medina? Again, the Jews. The marketplace, who's in control of the market? The Jews. They were the ones, uh, because of their monopoly over it, they could raise the prices, they could lower the prices, they could uh, you know, you know, ha have uh, monopolies, <laughs> they could make it, uh, things uh, scarce in the marketplace and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ saw that. And he wanted to put an end to that. He wanted to establish a pure, you know, Islamic economy. Uh, so he discussed this with Sahaba, and he said that he's looking for a place where uh, we can establish a market. Uh, now, perhaps in those days, you know, market had the day, uh, had the meaning, the understanding of you know a specific place where buying and trading and all of the all of the economic. Uh, uh, matters uh, will go on, right? So there has to be a place uh, where that is established. And the place uh, that was uh, prevalent uh, in Medina at that time was in the control of the Jews. Uh, so they went they went looking for that. Somebody found the place, actually, and they came, he came to the Prophet wasallam's, and he said, I have found the place. I have found the market. Come and take a look at it and see if uh, you approve. So the Prophet Adam said, yes, I will do that. And he came and he looked at it and, you know, uh, and he said, yes, this is a very nice place. And he kicked the ground and so on and said, yes, this is where we're going to establish our, our market. Uh, and so he did that. Uh, and gradually uh, the buyers and sellers and so on moved away from the monopoly of the Jews, uh, from the marketplace of the Jews, and they came to this place, an, ent uh, an entirely Islamic economy was established, away from the control of the Jews. So again, you know, this is an important point that I want you to bear in mind. Uh, but there are many things that we just say here, we cannot go into them in depth, and we may not necessarily be coming back to them as such, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, anybody who is uh, interested uh, in these matters, you know, uh, uh, and want to do further research into them, they can. They can. 
you can go deeply into the Sira and look at the, all of these things and see how the Islamic uh, economy developed uh, and they were able to rid themselves of uh, the domination of the Jews in this matter. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, I just wanted to stress that this is an extremely, uh, these are extremely important matters. If you want to have, uh, you know, um, a, a place, a society, a state that you are in control of, that is running according to Islamic law, running in the pure way, in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many aspects of it you have to look at. Uh, look at the situation in the world today. I mean, a brief comparison. Uh, the uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, all of the uh, countries of the world, all the economies of the world, are basically in the hands of a of a few people. Um, uh, yes, there are some uh, there are some nations that have uh, sort of broken the Western monopoly, but it is still there to a large extent. And, especially with all of the Muslim countries, all of the Arab countries, uh, all of the Muslim countries, they are still under the domination of the Western countries. And some of them are trying to break out of that and to drift, uh, but they are drifting where? They're not, uh, they're not trying to establish anything independent, but they're going into the other camp, the camp of the Chinese or the camp of the Russians and so on and so forth, right? Uh, this is a very uh, bad situation for Muslim and Muslim countries to be in uh, very precar precarious. How can we be independent, act independently, follow our own laws, you know, live, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, our, our our lives with our uh, our heads, uh, you know, high up that we are practicing Islam and so on, when our economy, uh, our economies are being controlled by others. So uh, that's the unfortunate situation that we need to break out of. Uh, inshallah, uh, that will happen. Uh, so we move on now, and let me talk about the Saraya and Ghazawat. Uh, <clears throat> the Saraya, plural uh, uh, the, of the word Saraya, Uh, there was military expeditions that did not involve the process, and he was not there, you know, physically in those. Uh, he uh, organized uh, most likely a small group of, uh, of men uh, and put one of them uh, uh, as the leader of them uh, and sent them on a mission. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that so you get a better understanding of it. And the Ghazawat, uh, Ghazwa is uh, those military expeditions in which the Prophet himself participated. Uh, this is how the Muslim historians uh, talk about them. The Sariya, uh, those uh, in which the Prophet himself was not present, but he, but he, um, men, their men that he had selected, uh, appointing one of them uh, as the leader. And the Ghazwa, uh, is the one in which he himself participated, and obviously uh, he was the leader of uh, those expeditions. Um, in the book uh, that was rec uh, recommended for you, the book by Mustafa Sebai, I think the translation of the word Saria, I don't like the translation. It says raids. Uh, these were not raids. These were not raids. Uh, but they are imp uh, import uh, important things that come out of, uh, of them. You know, what uh, uh, was uh, the purpose of uh, these uh, Saraya and the Ghazawat also? What was the purpose of them? Uh, so the Saraya we're, we're going to talk about first. Uh, uh, and these were the things that the Prophet Adam started with. Uh, he started with these small military expeditions, a few men uh, in them uh, with a, a leader. Uh, and this was giving them training in a, in a lot of things. And the benefits of these uh, uh, saraya were tremendous. Uh, but we have to, again, take a little uh, step back uh, before that. Uh, in Makkah, there was no permission to fight. They were told to be patient. Your patience was heavily uh, stressed, and patience meant restraint from fighting. 
do not engage the enemies uh, in hostilities, right? Uh, the Muslims were being persecuted in Mecca, uh, tortured, and so on, and they were not. Uh, they were told to re refrain from fighting back. Don't do anything. You have to take all of that. Uh, and of course, this was training uh, for for them in that stage. Uh, and the stage uh, that that stage uh, merited uh, certain situations, which uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, and his prophet con controlled, uh, you know, among the believers, uh, how they should act or react uh, to any situation. So they were told not to fight, but, but be patient. Uh, but uh, just at the end of the Makki period, as the Muslims were migrating uh, to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the permission to, for them to fight. In Surah Al-Hajj, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ أَلَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ بِغَيْرِ حَقٍ إِلَّا أَنْ يَقُولُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ وَلَوْ لَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَهُدِّمَتْ صَوَامِعُ وَبِيَعٌ وَصَرَوَاتٌ وَمَسَاجِدُ يُذْكَرُ فِيهَا اسْمُ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا وَلَا يَنْصُرَنَّ اللَّهُ مَا يَنْصُرُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Permission to fight has been given to those who are, who are being fought against because they were wronged. And indeed, Allah is competent to give them victory. They are those who have been evicted from their homes without right only because they say our Lord is Allah. And were it not that Allah checks the, uh, some people by means of others, they would have been demolished. Monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of Allah is much mentioned. And Allah will surely support those who support him. Indeed, Allah is powerful and exalted in might. Uh, and the other verse goes on to say, and there are those, uh, that is, those who are now given permission to fight. Uh, those who, if we give them authority in the land, the khilafah, or tamkeen in the land, uh, they establish prayer and, and pay zakat and enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And we can see that this is the aim uh, of the Islamic State and this is the aim of an Islamic society and this is the aim of what we are struggling for, to establish the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, uh, in the land, to establish, be able to establish prayer and, prayer and pay zakat and so on, do all of our Islamic duties without fear, you know, without... Uh, uh, you know, any fear of being attacked or anything like that, you know, and being able to do it in the proper way, openly, and, and so on and so forth, and being able to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, if not, you know, what, what would have been happening if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give the permission to fight, uh, then uh, places of worship would be destroyed. Monasteries, churches, synagogues, mosques, uh, etc. Uh, there, there are long explanations of uh, this, these uh, verses, uh, which uh, we will not go into. But here you can see that uh, it is only permission that is given. It is not uh, being made compulsory for the Muslims to fight. They are only being given permission to fight. Uh, afterwards in Medina, uh, at a somewhat later stage, not, not very long after that, perhaps uh, in Medina, uh, the situation became a sort because of the hostilities that were there, uh, both both uh, possibly from within, uh, and those people like the Jews uh, who are living uh, within Medina, uh, and from outside, especially from the Mushrikeen, from, from uh, Quraysh and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only gave them permission to fight, uh, but uh, he developed it further. Uh, there was a time when they had to fight. It became compulsory for, the, for them to fight also. Uh, <clears throat> and in many cases, all of them had to be involved in that. Um, although many of them perhaps had uh, the you know training in that uh, because uh, of the way that the Arab society was and the Arab tribes were and so on, they were all lear learning to fight uh, you know, in their own ways. Uh, in that environment, they all had, you know, to protect themselves and to be a part of the tribe and defend the tribe and so on and so forth, right? So they, all of them had some kind of training in fighting, 
uh, which uh, in many cases, of course, it is not enough for what is going to happen, uh, what is developing, you know, all of the hostilities that are developing against, uh, against Muslims uh, and against uh, the Islamic state and the Islamic society. Uh, so the Prophet وسلم, saw that he needed to train his people more in a more systematic way. And so this is uh, what he used the saraya for. You know, um, uh, and uh, the saraya, the many saraya almost, you know, immediately after arriving in Medina and uh, after the masjid was built and so on, he started to organize these. And one saraya after the other went out, one is coming back and perhaps another one is leaving Medina, going on a mission assigned to them by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and the benefit of this uh, word from, uh, well, the Prophet وسلم, in, the, in the early uh, Saraya, uh, all of those before the Battle of Badr. Uh, and Badr, the Battle of Badr took place uh, in, the uh, in the second year of the Hijrah in the month of Ramadan, right? Uh, just bear that in mind. So before that point in time, the Saraya that were leaving uh, Medina, uh, they were very, very frequent, uh, one after the other, but they only involved the Muhajirin. The Prophet Salam only appointed Muhajirin to go on these, except uh, perhaps the last one that led actually into the Battle of Badr. Uh, so why did he select Muhajirin alone and not the Ansar? Uh, one of the reasons uh, is that uh, the, Muhajir, the Ansar had promised uh, the, the pledge that they had made with him uh, by by Atul Aqaba uh, was uh, to protect him if he came to them, uh, not to protect him outside of Medina, but inside of Medina, and he didn't want to break that uh, that uh, understanding with them. Uh, he but however he gave them opportunities uh, to expand it if they wanted, and uh, in, uh, and later on we can see that it did become expanded. Uh, in fact, uh, they agreed uh, to be with him and to fight you know, with him against the enemies and so on, even outside of Medina. Uh, this is something that developed uh, perhaps in a natural way, uh, something that they were in agreement with. <clears throat> but at first, uh, they, uh, that, that was, um, you know, the agreement uh, was that they will protect him in Medina. Uh, the second thing is that uh, the Muhajirin were the one, ones who were wronged by the Meccans, uh, uh, they, were, they were expelled from Medina, evicted from Medina. Uh, their homes and their properties were taken away from them, or were, were uh, you know, uh, uh, you may say stolen uh, by the Meccans, taken uh, uh, by them. Uh, so, uh, uh, and of course, uh, while they were there in Mecca, they were being persecuted, and you know, they were being attacked and uh, and harmed physically. Uh, so physically, as well as verbally, you know, a lot of insults against them and so on. Uh, and then you know, the attacks, or, or the confiscation of their properties and their wealth and all of that. Uh, and they were eventually kicked out of uh, Mecca. So all of the, these wrongs, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all of that. Because of that, they are now given the permission to fight. Uh, so they're going out in this saraya and they're encountering, uh, the, uh, one of their main missions was to check on the movements of Quraysh. See how their caravans, their trade caravans are moving and so on. Uh, and if there is an opportunity uh, to attack them, uh, that can be done. Uh, if there is an opportunity uh, to take away some of the wealth, the wealth that they have uh, in those caravans, uh, then that can be done, and this is this this was justice because those were the people who had stolen uh, the wealth and the properties of uh, the muhajirin. So they were just taking back actually what uh, belonged to them. Now you will find that uh, many uh, of the uh, uh, what do you call them uh, the orientalists, uh, you know, from the early days, uh, used to say that. Um, uh, the Muslims, uh, they were per being persecuted in Mecca, but after they uh, were able to establish a, a state where they were living freely and so on, now they themselves started to act uh, like the Bedouin Arabs 
uh, and attack uh, uh, innocent uh, travelers and so on. This is not the case. Uh, when you look at it, uh, when you study it deeply, you will see this is not the case. They did not attack innocent travelers. Who they attacked uh, were the Meccan, the people of Mecca. These are the people that they had a grouse with, right? They had a problem with. These are the people who had expelled them from their homes, taken away their properties and all of that. Uh, so I think you can understand that situation. We don't uh, need to you know, harp too much about it and so on. You know, and as you're uh, thinking about uh, these matters, we can think about uh, the current situation that is happening, right? Um, uh, 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 and, and well, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more in uh, concerning one of the uh, Sariyas, one of the Saraya. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Uh, but there were many other benefits that came out of these uh, Sariyas uh, that the Prophet Sallam sent out. The Meccans, of course, uh, they were not uh, residents in Medina originally, so they did not know the terrain. Uh, they did not know the surroundings, and this was a way for them to get to know that. Uh, they were sent out on these missions all around Medina, and now they are becoming more and more familiar with the place. Uh, this is important for them uh, for their you know, defense of Medina when they, are, when they would be called to, to do so. Uh, and important for them when they have to go out of, of Medina on uh, major expeditions also, and perhaps uh, fighting and so on uh, would be in, you know, they would be involved in that. So they had to have a, a deep knowledge of the terrain, the land, and also they had to have a, a deep knowledge of the people who are surrounding them, uh, the various tribes, the Bedouin tribes and so on. They had to know who are hostile, who are friendly. Uh, and they could do da'wah at the same time. Uh, so they approached many of them doing da'wah, inviting them to Islam. Uh, so uh, there are lots of benefits uh, uh, and perhaps many other things uh, beside uh, these things that come to mind immediately, you know, uh, as we are speaking here. Many other benefits uh, that they would have gotten, you know, uh, and the military training. Don't talk about the military training, right? Um, they are getting that at the same time. Uh, they're able uh, to develop militarily, and ju not just militarily, but Islamically also. They're learning to be obedient to the Amir who is appointed over them. This is both, both a, a, a military necessity that uh, uh, all the soldiers in the army uh, or, or in, the, in that detachment, uh, they must be obedient uh, to their leader, right? Islamically, uh, that is required also in any uh, Islamic society. Uh, even, of course, we know in Salah, the Salah is a, a type of uh, that kind of training. We have to be, be, we have to be following the leader. So they were getting that type of training. They were getting to know each other better. Uh, they were getting to live with each other, cooperate with each other, help each other out in difficulties in traveling. You know, uh, look for the firewood and uh, cook the food uh, together, help each other, you know, feed it to, you know, uh, offer it to each other and so on and so forth, right? Help each other to clean up, uh, you know, after they had finished eating and so on. Uh, many things, many types of, you know, discipline. Discipline uh, was being learned in all of these expeditions. Uh, this is something, unfortunately, we find that the vast majority of Muslims do not have uh, today. The discipline. Uh, so we do need to go back into that kind of training, a sort of military uh, training uh, that uh, would instill uh, discipline into us uh, while at the same time uh, enabling us uh, to get to know each other more deeply and be able to uh, work with each other, do things together and accomplish uh, things together and so on. Uh, so lots of benefits uh, in this uh, Saraya. Uh, we cannot talk about uh, them, uh, um, you know, all of them uh, that took place uh, before the Battle of Badr, uh, but uh, a couple of them are very important. One of them, I just want, just one of them I want to speak about. Uh, this was one uh, that was headed by Abdullah ibn, ibn Jahsh. Abdullah ibn Jahsh. Uh, so the Prophet appointed him as the leader of uh, a group. Uh, and he did not tell them what was their end destination. Uh, he told them, you go and travel to such and such a point. And only when you reach that point and open my letter, he gave them a letter, a written letter. 
Only then open that letter and read it. Uh, and that is uh, telling Abdullah to do that. Uh, and then uh, you proceed uh, uh, onwards uh, according to the instructions that are there in it. In it. But do not force anyone, uh, any of the men to go with you. Uh, give them the choice uh, to go. So um, uh, the instruction to, to, to make uh, the, uh, I don't want to prolong it too much, but eventually, you know, they were instructed to go to a place, I think it is called Nakhla, that is south of Mecca. In other words, they had to go past Mecca. From Medina, they had to go southwards and past Mecca. They had to buy skirt Mecca. All of the enemy are there. And of course, if uh, they see Muslims, a group of Muslims and so on, they will not be treating them nicely. They will not allow them to come into Mecca to make Umrah or anything like that. So they had to pass secretly, pass by Mecca secretly and go to this place that is called Nakhla between uh, Mecca and Taif. <clears throat> uh, and you know, there, uh, there is the, uh, a caravan of Quraysh that is passing there. Uh, um, you know, check the movements of uh, of them and uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so they had to do a lot of you can say spy work and many of the saraya, the sara, the saraya, uh, they had to do that kind of works, uh, spying, you know, uh, ensuring that they know the movements of the enemies and so on. Uh, so they go into that area uh, and they encounter uh, this caravan. Now, uh, it was, um, I think, uh, in, the, in the last day uh, of Rajab. Uh, and they were perhaps not sure exactly when uh, Rajab uh, is ending. But, you know, of course, they knew that they had started off uh, this uh, travel uh, in the month of Rajab, uh, which is one of the sacred months. And according uh, to the... Uh, <clears throat> the custom uh, of the Arabs uh, all over the Arabian Peninsula, there can be no hostilities uh, during this month. And there are four months in all that are the sacred months in which there are no hostilities. You cannot open hostilities. You pass by your enemy, uh, you cannot you know, fight, uh, fight them. You know. So... <clears throat> Now, now, this caravan had wealth for Quraysh in it. And they knew that um, uh, they had the permission to fight. They had the permission to take the wealth of Quraysh because actually uh, this is wealth that belonged to them. Uh, and they thought uh, if, uh, they, uh, if they waited until the, um, the month ended, maybe just a few hours, uh, uh, that caravan would escape them. They were, it would be gone out of reach. They would not be able to uh, capture it anymore. Uh, so they decided that they will attack, uh, although it is perhaps still uh, the month of Rajab. Uh, and so they attacked the caravan and they were able to uh, defeat the, the, people, the men there. They killed two of the men. Um, uh, and they captured the wealth uh, of the caravan and so on, and they went back to Medina with it. So when Quraysh heard of this situation, of course, they started to make a big stink about it. Uh, Muslims are violating the sacred month. There's a big you know, propaganda ca campaign against uh, the Muslims. You know, think of the situation today, what is happening in, in this Palestinian uh, situation. Uh, is exactly the same, I would say. Uh, the Palestinians did something, <laughs> and the rest of the world, especially the governments, most of many of the governments, and especially the Western world, and the Western media, and of course the Israeli media, and so on, starts this huge campaign now, you know, against uh, them, and saying uh, they have done everything wrong. You know, they, they are terrorists and so on. They have attacked innocent people. They have killed uh, women. They have killed children. They have raped women. You know, they, in fact, a lot of lies are, of course, being be, being told on this uh, in this situation here. A lot of uh, disinformation is being spread about Muslims, lies against Muslims uh, that are being spread in this situation. Uh, uh, of course, I, uh, again, I will not go into you know a, a full-fledged discussion on this matter, uh, 
uh, I just want to, wanted you to be able to, you know, uh, link the two and compare them, right? You know, every, uh, uh, many of the points in the CIRA, we have to reflect on uh, our situation and see how they are relevant and what we can do. Uh, I think, unfortunately, one, uh, you know, because the Muslims do not control the world media, one, and secondly, because many Muslims uh, don't know Islam properly, and many Muslims are hypocrites, and many Muslims are, you know, compromising, and so on and so forth. And we see many of the Arab nations, uh, especially the governments, uh, you know, uh, uh, making these uh, overtures uh, to Israel, uh, normas, you know, uh, the normalization, the so-called tatbiya, uh, normalization process uh, with Israel, and so on. Uh, you know, they are, they, they are all in such a weak position that they, they can, uh, uh, they hardly speak out against the atrocities that the Israelis are committing. Uh, they, they're unable to say, uh, and they are unable to defend uh, the Palestinians uh, when they uh, make a, a step like this. Now, these people are the ones, uh, of course, who have been showing the hostility. They're the ones who have been wronging the Palestinians uh, for 75 years and, uh, and more than that, in fact. Uh, they're the ones who have been killing Palestinians, taking away their lands and taking away their properties, destroying their farms and so on and so forth. Uh, and I would say that every Israeli um, uh, is a is an enemy, sort of, right? Uh, you know, um, we are saying these things. Maybe our our session is uh, being listened into by by others, but uh, this is not a time to be silent on these matters. They are the enemies. They are the ones who started hostilities. They are the ones who are pra uh, practicing apartheid and so on and so forth against the Palestinians. This is something uh, a lot of the world has come out now in this situation and started to speak about. Alhamdulillah for that, that many of the world, many of the many non-Muslims uh, ha have seen that and they are, uh, they are speaking out uh, about this matter. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, uh, the, the position of the Muslim uh, governments is still very, very muted. Although, you know, half-heartedly they have had to say uh, that... Uh, uh, they, they have, they have, that is, they have had to say some things uh, about, you know, what the Israelis are doing and so on. Perhaps, you know, uh, at this point in time, they don't want to be seen, seen you know, as um, being uh, against the Palestinians and, you know, criticizing and just for Israel and so on. Uh, they're trying to save their faces by saying a few things, but it is very half-hearted, uh, not coming from the depths of their heart, not being sincere and so on. So we should not be fooled by them, and nor should we be fooled by the Western propaganda uh, and all of these attacks uh, and criticisms and lies and so on that are being told in this situation. Uh, they say, you know, um, you know, for, for long, uh, the, the, the saying is there in the West, perhaps all over the world, that the first casualty of war is the truth. They know that, and this is what they are doing. Uh, they have uh, put aside the truth, and uh, you know, and are spreading a lot of lies in this situation. So that is what happened uh, in that time also, uh, with this Sharia of Abdullah ibn Jahsh. Uh, the Quraysh uh, and the enemies of Islam saw the opportunity uh, to wage a propaganda war against Muslims, and that is what they did. And then when the Jews heard, heard that, they also started to pick it up, right? Uh, they also started to side with Quraysh. Um, this is before two years had elapsed uh, in Medina. The Jews were already breaking their treaty with the Muslims and siding with Quraysh. Uh, then when the, the Muslim, the, this group of uh, People, you know, the the, exped the military expedition when they came back to Medina with the, with the booty that they had captured from that caravan, uh, and uh, 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 of course they had killed uh, two of the enemy. Uh, the Prophet Sallam, you know, because of all of this talk, uh, the Prophet Sallam, perhaps he was in a difficulty uh, as to what exactly to do and. Uh, he did not accept the booty uh, uh, and 
you know, he kept silent about the men who were killed and so on, the men who were killed, because that's another part of the propaganda against uh, uh, those Muslims that they had killed during the sacred, sacred month. Uh, uh, and the Muslims in Medina, now they started to criticize uh, this small group of people until, you know, the, the, this group perhaps started to feel you know, very perhaps ashamed of what, what they had done. They started to feel, you know, very bad about the whole situation. And so their own brothers now are criticizing them for it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this, uh, uh, an ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ uh, They ask you about the sacred month fighting in it. قُلْ قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ Say fighting in it is a grave matter, a tremendous matter. It's, not, it's something that should not be done. Perhaps, uh, you know, this was uh, from the teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salam that uh, the Arabs uh, still had with them. But here we can see that they were utilizing it not for a good cause. They were using it as a propaganda against the Muslims. The Muslims who were the oppressed. Who were the oppressors? Uh, it was Quraysh. Now Quraysh is... Uh, uh, because of this mistake that uh, a small group of Muslims had made, they were trying to turn it into a propaganda against, you know, all, all Muslims and so on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now turns it against them. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a big matter to fight uh, uh, and to kill and so on in the sacred month. But these things that you have been doing, you know, kufr, the first thing, kufr uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, uh, and then um, the persecution uh, of uh, the believers, stopping them from entering into Mecca and from making Hajj and Umrah and so on, and then confiscating their properties and ejecting them from their homes and so on and so forth. All of these things are worse than uh, what the, this small group of Muslims had done. Uh, all of that is worse uh, than fighting uh, in the sacred month. So, uh, you know, when, of course, uh, this is, uh, here is uh, you fight propaganda with, uh, uh, not just propaganda, but you fight it with the truth, with uprightness. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing on behalf of the Muslims. And so this word spread. You are the ones, you Quraysh are the ones who are the ones who started the hostilities in the first place. Uh, and you did not leave us alone to migrate, but you kept after us also, they were, of course, uh, and they were planning their hostilities and so on. Of course, the Prophet said, um, you know, tried to, um, you know, take a, a step ahead of them before they can actually do any serious harm, uh, before they can be serious fighting and so on. The Prophet said, um, had taken the step of, uh, of sending out these men and so on. So the Saraya. So you are the ones uh, who are in the wrong and now you are blaming the Muslims. So you are saying that the Muslims have done so, such and such. Uh, so after the, this verse was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, you know, welcomed uh, these, uh, uh, this group of Muslims back you know, into the fold and so on. They, they had not done anything wrong. They were welcomed back and of course all of the Muslims stopped saying anything uh, bad about them and so on. The Prophet وسلم, accepted the booty he took the booty and he shared it among them. The Prophet you know, uh, you know, uh, accepted that. Well, they ki they killed men and so on. Uh, Quraysh came, uh, uh, and they wanted um, uh, uh, they, they wanted uh, the, what what is known as the blood money for for these people who are killed. And so, on, the Prophet Sallam. I'm not sure. I think he did not give it to them because, you know, this is war. This is warfare. We have a legitimate right now to kill uh, the enemy. Uh, so uh, this was an important step uh, that really uh, changed uh, things, changed uh, the perspective of Muslims. Uh, and uh, again, you know, we, you know, we have to go back and forth a bit, uh, you know, a bit. The Muslims uh, in, in Mecca, when they were told not to fight, they were told to be patient. They were told, told to take the persecution and the torture and all of that uh, and just keep silent about it. 
uh, for 14 years that was happening. So 13 years in uh, in Mecca. And then at least one year, one and a half years in Medina. Uh, they were like this, right? And when people are accustomed uh, to being abused over a long period of time, uh, they perhaps start to think of that, you know, that, well, this is a situation that will continue. You know, when they cannot speak out against their enemies and so on, when they feel that they will be attacked more if they speak out against the enemies and so uh, they tend to remain silent and say nothing about nothing, you know, about uh, the oppression, you know, and, uh, and so on that uh, is being meted out against them. Uh, they, send, they tend to remain timid. Uh, they do not come out, you know, they're not bold, they're, they're not ready to fight, they're not prepared to fight, you know, they're not trained to fight and so on and so forth. So all of that situation had to be changed. Uh, and we can compare that also, that situation with the, with the, those early Muslims uh, uh, to uh, what had happened to Bani Israel uh, when they were in Egypt. You know, so many years of oppression under Fir'aun had made them very timid. Uh, and accept their, you know, eventually accepting their situation and so on. And they had lost a lot of the good uh, character that uh, they used to have, you know, as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, they were now, you know, a, a set of people who could not be trusted and so on. And that is why Musa alayhi salam had a very, very difficult time with them after he led them out of Egypt. You know, you could see in them the slave mentality. You know, they were still still thinking themselves as slaves. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Jews of today, very often, they still hark back to that situation. Uh, you know, they still start, try to cry, cry for anything that is said again uh, uh, about them. Any slight criticism. This is anti-Semitism. And they still pretend that they're the ones who are being oppressed while uh, not accepting that they are the oppressors, they are the ones who, are, who have established uh, an apartheid system and so on. They're the ones whom everybody else needs to come to, to help because they're the ones who are being oppressed. Um, uh, and they have gotten a lot of the rest of the world, especially the, the Western world and so on, to accept that position. Uh, and nobody can, in the West can openly speak out against you know, against the Jews and what they are doing, right? Against Israelis, uh, you know, it's not a matter of Jews really. Uh, it is a matter of what the Israelis and the Zionists and so on uh, have, have been doing. Uh, but there are a lot of Jews uh, today who are siding with Palestine, who are speaking out against uh, Israel and the Zionists and so on, right? Uh, so we have to say Alhamdulillah for that. Uh, and the Israelis uh, internally, even or uh, even though all of them might be sub, uh, might be one uh, in this matter of opposing the Palestinians, uh, and it uh, and remember also, it is not just a, a matter of Palestinians. Actually, they are fighting against Islam. It is not just the Palestinians that they are fighting against. Uh, they are trying to suppress Islam. Uh, again, we don't have the time to have a deeper discussion of this matter, but we should all be uh, conscious of that matter, cognizant of it. You know, if the Palestinians are defeated, it is Muslims uh, who are defeated. And the Jew, uh, those are Israelis and Zionists and so on will try to take more and more advantage over Muslims. Um, so... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there, there are those uh, who are opposing that situation. They don't uh, see it uh, uh, as right, uh, you know, as right for themselves as Jews to be doing that, and so they're opposing the Zionists and the, the uh, and Israel, the state of Israel, and so on. Uh, so Alhamdulillah for that. Uh, but internally, also many of them, even though uh, they might be one in terms of their. Uh, the enmity towards the Palestinians and towards Muslims uh, on the whole, uh, yet they are divided among themselves. And Alhamdulillah, you know, we are seeing that, that they are divided. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about them earlier on in the Madani surahs and sa says uh, in Surah Al-Hashr, Tahsabuhum jami'an wa qulubuhum shadda. You see them to be all together. All one, right? You think that they are all one, 
for their hearts uh, are in different places. So they are like that today. The Israeli society is like that today. They will come come together to, to oppose the fight against Muslims uh, and especially Palestinians. Uh, however, uh, they have a lot of too, too many ir irreconcilable di differences uh, among themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. Uh, so this is the fight, unfortunately, we're up against uh, uh, with, with all of these uh, Western governments uh, uh, supporting uh, Israel. Uh, and all of uh, and many of them and many individuals uh, saying, you know, you should wipe out uh, all of Gaza, everyone in Gaza. We're not going to take them as refugees or anything like that, right? Wipe them all or kill them all. That's what they're encouraging uh, Israel uh, to do. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it difficult for them because the rest of the world uh, is coming out in opposition to that. This cannot be done. This should not be done. Um, so uh, they are facing a losing battle in terms of the propaganda war, but they are trying hard. Uh, so propaganda is one of the very important things that happens in war. Uh, and we as Muslims should know uh, you should know about this and should be able to read the situation very clearly. Unfortunately, I see many Muslims uh, criticizing the Palestinians and saying that the, you know, the, those are terrorists who made that attack. Why should we say something like that, that uh, uh, Hamas and so on are terrorists? Why should we adopt uh, uh, you know, the American administration not Americans, uh, but the American administration position in this matter. Why should we adopt the Israeli position in this matter? Hamas are not uh, terrorists, uh, uh, and the Palestinians in general are not terrorists. Uh, they are freedom fighters, or, or you know, Islamic Jihad, or whatever. They are not terrorists. Uh, they are fighting for their freedom. Uh, they are fighting for their people, and so on. Uh, The atrocities that have been committed against them need to be redressed. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we we link the two situations, and we can, uh, you know, think uh, think of them, uh, derive many many lessons, uh, many many understanding, uh, and I think the Muslim Muslims themselves need uh, to read the situations in a better way and understand what is really going on uh, and take a better position based on our deeper understanding of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is uh, imperative that all Muslims and especially those who are in the leadership and claiming to speak on behalf of Muslims, uh, it is important for all of them to know the seerah deeply uh, and to know the positions that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had taken. Well, so, <clears throat> so that was the Sariya that I wanted to speak about. Uh, actually, we are again uh, over time. If there are any questions, uh, uh, you can, uh, you know, forward those questions now, send, send those questions. Uh, uh, if I can see them, or if any one of you want, want to speak, you can perhaps open your mic and speak. Um, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, the, the other, th the, uh, one other Sariya that uh, led into the, uh, not Sariya actually, this, uh, this was a Ghazwa, because it was led by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before the Battle of Badr, and this led into the Battle of Badr. Uh, you know, uh, there, there was a group, uh, a caravan of uh, Quraysh that was passing close to Medina and was not well armed. You know, and perhaps up to that time, uh, Quraysh was not, uh, uh, you know, thinking that they're going to have to do battle with the Muslims, that they are, you know, they might be thinking they're in a stronger position. Uh, they don't have to have so much defense, a great, very great defense of their caravan, you know, for their caravans and so on. They could just pass by Medina and everything will be okay going up north. Uh, but this caravan that was led by Abu Sufyan, 
uh, the Prophet uh, wanted to capture it and he sent out men to do so. Uh, but uh, the caravan escaped them and went, for, went further. And when it was coming back, uh, uh, the Prophet you know, prepared for it coming back and so on. And he himself uh, also went out uh, and other Muslims went with him, including uh, Ansar this time went with him. But they were not thinking that they are, they will be fighting. They will be you know, they will be encountering you know, a, a battle as such with Quraysh, because uh, the caravan was lightly armed, uh, lightly protected, and they would be able to maybe overcome it very easily and capture uh, the booty and so on that they were bringing back uh, from uh, from from the north. Uh, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala caused a different situation to occur uh, than they were expecting. Uh, and so then eventually the Battle of Badr occurred. Uh, we're going to talk about this uh, uh, and other battles, uh, inshallah, in our next uh, session. Next week of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity. Uh, so uh, if there are any questions or anything, uh, any comments or so that anyone wants to make, uh, I... Uh, 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 you know, uh, cannot. Uh, I, I'm not seeing. I, I'm not sure if uh, I can't see any screen where um, or any part of the screen where uh, comments are made. So, if there are any, uh, I think Dr. Abu Zaidah might still be here with us. Uh, if you are there or anyone else, uh, if there's any questions or comments, uh, let's hear them. I have a quick question. Um, just maybe it's not related fully, but um, tomorrow there's an international day of fasting called for the Palestine situation. Is there any religious uh, potential problem with that? Just calling for everyone to do a specific act of worship on a day for some reason that's not necessarily... Yeah. Uh, yes, I was asked I was asked this question uh, and uh, after giving my answer which was, I don't see it to be haram. <laughs> it is not haram you know, although I, you know, I personally don't like, uh, uh, you know, these kind of calls to be made. Uh, however, I did, I do not see it as be, as being haram to do that. However, you know, afterwards I, uh, I uh, heard of, uh, I didn't actually read it myself. Uh, my wife, my wife uh, read uh, a response that someone uh, made. No, not to me, not to my answer. Uh, but to the question itself, because apparently the question is circulating. Um, uh, 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 you know, saying that uh, this is, uh, you know, talking about what uh, what fasting is, how the Prophet did fasting, and, you know, the individual fast, uh, uh, um, uh, which, are, which is done by individual, you know, the voluntary fast, and so on, done by individual. There's no collective, you know, voluntary fast like that, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and they condemned, uh, you know, that uh, kind of act, you know, left, right, and center, to do something like that collectively, to fast collectively, and so on. This is something, you know, uh, 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 against, apparently against the Sunnah. This, uh, this is bid'ah, and so on. Um, but these situations, uh, you, you know, th things like this uh, keep occurring, and these kind of questions, you know, we uh, we, we we keep being asked, uh, and you know. Personally, I don't see anything wrong in doing that, although I would not call for, for, for that to be done. Uh, I would not try to you know, impose a situation like that upon other Muslims and saying, you know, this is something that we do, this is, uh, you know, this is something very good and you know, uh, it should be happening, it should be publicized and so on and so forth. Um, let ev uh, every individual Muslim decide, you know, if they want to fast, uh, uh, for the cause, alhamdulillah, let them do that. They can choose their own days and so on. It doesn't have to be a single collective day. Uh, if they do it, if a group of them come together, a small group perhaps, you know, a group here and there and come together, do it collectively, what, whatever they want to do, I don't see that as being a problem. Uh, and I would say go ahead and do, uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, I, I don't think of, of it, uh, you know, as being a bid'ah. So that is basically uh, my position on this and uh, other similar matters. Um, uh, this, uh, of course, there's much more that we can do and we should do uh, for the cause. Uh, we need to make our voices collectively heard. Perhaps that is more important than the fasting, making our voices collectively heard. 
you know, we should all be, you know, uh, giving the same message uh, to our leaders, you know, the leaders of this country. Why are you supporting Israel while Israel, uh, the Israelis have been uh, the oppressors uh, throughout all of these uh, years uh, from the very beginning, uh, be even before the establishment of uh, the Israeli state. They're the ones who are the oppressors. They have been practicing apartheid. They have been destroying uh, Palestinian lands and farms and so on, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, We should make our voices heard in this matter uh, and uh, uh, try to get others on our side. You know, uh, I see a lot of others you know, who are speaking out uh, also, non-Muslims who are speaking out. Uh, but uh, you know, though our voices, all of the us collectively, need to be raised uh, much higher. Uh, to and not just voices. Uh, is there any other action that we can take? Practical action. Uh, uh, we should perhaps uh, uh, you know another thing that I uh, thought of is that uh, we need to go to our politicians. And I think many are doing that. Uh, go to the power politicians. You know, we supported you, we voted for you, and so on and so forth. Now, and, and you have been promising us. You have been promising support and so on. Now it is time for you to show our support, or else we're going to withdraw our support for you. Why should we continue to support you if you are not recognizing us and supporting a just cause like this? Right. So we should go and try to put pressure on our politicians uh, locally and so on. Uh, so maybe, maybe there, there are other things that we can perhaps uh, think of doing. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, you know, we have to be patient. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the early Muslims to be patient, uh, not to respond in a violent way or anything like that. We have to be like that. We have to be pa patient. And uh, we have to continue to make a dua. I heard, uh, and, and just uh, again, you know, uh, uh, a little more uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, I, I watched a video by uh, an Arab brother, and he spoke very well, you know, uh, on this matter. Uh, but I, I think he took, uh, uh, for me, uh, a somewhat um, passive or negative uh, position. Uh, he he was saying that you know the Palestinians have done what they could do. Uh, and that is the Nasr from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think this is a very good point. This is not a point that I object to. What is the concept of Nasr? Nasr doesn't necessarily mean, you know, victory in the battlefield. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the ability, you know, to do what you should be doing as a Muslim, uh, and you do that, uh, then this is a Nasr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has extended to you. So if we are able to do what we can do in our situation, uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us, has given us Nasr. Uh, uh, and I, I agree with him in this matter. When we look at Surah Al-Buruj, uh, the believers were victorious, not, uh, not because they won uh, the battle against that king. They did not, right? Uh, they were all put to death. But they were the victorious. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Uh, because victory uh, is according to the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not, not according to human scales. According to the scale of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the believers are the ones who are victorious, as long as they act in the proper way and so on. Uh, so that's an important point. But then he was also saying that uh, the Muslims all over the world, we're making dua, and we are also saying, uh, you know, this ayah or part of an ayah, uh, uh, you know, how many a small band of people defeated a large band of people by the will of Allah, by the permission of Allah. And we just sit back and, uh, and say that Allah is going to take care of things. Allah can make them victorious, you know, if he wants and so on. Um, so we are just making dua and we are sitting back and saying, oh Allah, you go ahead and fight and we, uh, and we are sitting here. Um, I don't think it is like that. I mean, this is uh, putting too much burden upon Muslims. Uh, the situation that we are in today, I think uh, a lot of Muslims are, are not just making dua, uh, but we are trying to uh, be as active as possible in the way that we can be. 
Uh, so yes, uh, when is it, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid said that uh, there's going to be uh, this uh, rally and so on. Uh, even small things like that. I mean, it might be. It might look. Uh, why do we need to do? Nobody will. Uh, will take note of it. The politicians will not take note of it or whatsoever. But we don't know. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala knows, and we do what we can. So, I think I've spoken more than I should <laughs> on this issue. But <laughs> going. Uh, any other? Uh, Anyone else have questions? Just feel free to unmute. And if you're a brother, make uh, the video camera on. So we'll give you a minute. Anyone have questions? I didn't see anything in the chat box. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So, so we can close. Uh, you know, I don't want to go for the la last couple of times we've been going over the uh, the time. I don't want to go over generally. If we can stop at the correct time, we should. Uh, or, uh, you know, not prolong the discussion, you know, too much over the time. Uh, so let's close here. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdika. Nashadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubi ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.